There you go, all changed. Ah, so we're going to throw it to you in a... Please, by the way. Uh, we're going to throw it to you in a minute, because we've got some really cool Blu-rays and stuff in ways you can just stand up and <coughs> hand up and ask questions. Blah, this in City 2, and Nurse 3D, and all that kind of stuff. Um, Matt, how did this project come about? Um, I, uh, I live in London, and a few years ago, I was quite sort of peripatetic. I kept on moving around, so I moved around every different um, borough and with the cranny of London. <coughs> and I couldn't take all my stuff with me. I was living in quite a small flat, so I started putting stuff in storage, as you do, especially in London, because there's very few houses that feel good up in the flats, everybody uses storage. And I started to get to know different storage facilities, and uh, I couldn't afford one of them, they're very expensive, so I ended up getting worse and worse ones. And uh, I ended up with my stuff in one down the A40, which if anybody knows is not the most salubrious road in London. And um, it was 24 hours one, and I was there late one night, and there was nobody in it from me and the security guard. And it had three floors, and I think I was on the second floor, and I was going to my unit, and uh, I got lost going to the unit. I couldn't remember where it was, I was going round and round in circles. And I thought, oh, it's a bit like that, moving the cube or something, you know, you don't know where you turn the corner, you thought, have I come this way? Or, you know, where have I come from? And then I found my unit again, and in this particular storage facility, um, the units were made out of sort of steel um, compartments, but unusually they stopped at about six foot above them. There was uh, chicken wire fencing, which is not, doesn't make it very private for security. There. And I was very curious as to what other people had in their units, and I had some chairs in my unit, so I pulled the chair out and, and stood on top of it and peered through the chicken wire fencing into the unit next door. And um, what I saw made me fall backwards off my chair because there was like 30 naked mannequins staring back at me. <laughs> um, which was just a little disturbing at half past 11 at night in this place with nothing in it apart from me. And I thought, oh, interesting. You know, maybe we can make a horror movie set here. Um, so I pulled, I went out the corridor, there was no one there, so I pulled my chair out into the corridor and then looked in every single unit on the way down the corridor. And um, there was, you know, there was a bunch of weird old antique toys in one, there was a no one full of old clothes. And I just thought, what do you, you know, what, what the hell do you keep in it? Everything and anything and everything. And I, I spoke to security guards because I'm quite a nosy person. I always like talking to some security guards and taxi drivers and anyone. Because you always get good stories out of them. And I said, what's the weirdest thing you've seen in this place? And he said, well, somebody did bring a stuffed tiger once. And um, then he also said, you know, the police always go around they come around once a month with sniffing dogs. I said, why is that? He said, well, a lot of people keep drugs in here. There's a lot of uh, stolen cigarettes, uh, which is a massive trade always in London in uh, storage units. And then I sort of started researching you know, what people put into storage units. And there was a teacher in Brighton who put his girlfriend in a storage unit. I think he was involved in some SNN game that made it wrong. And he didn't really want to, didn't know how to handle it, so he chopped her up and put her in a storage unit. <laughs> and just, uh, you know, if I, if I, if anyone murders somebody, usually the stuff they've done it with ends up in a storage unit. So the first place the police look at is in their storage unit. And I just thought, well, it could be an idea. <laughs> uh, so I spoke to a couple of writing friends I worked with them, we tried various stories, and the, the, the one we sort of delighted on was the, the one you just saw. Okay, guys, so there's Greg's on one side and the other shop's on the other. So you choose, Greg, yeah, you choose. Okay, I'll, I'll come down. <laughs> I, um, I love the film, I thought it was a really tricky level of suspense. Oh, uh, was, it, uh, was it filmed um, on, on a set or, or was, it an actual, was it in an actual storage unit? Well, uh, that's an interesting question because initially everybody said, look, you should shoot it in a storage unit because it's all there and you save a lot of money, but you can't really do it in there because they're all working and there are also massive fire risks in those places. If you need to put the clue in there, it's a massive fire risk. So we, we built it all, and um, we shot most of it at a studio uh, in East London called Three Mills. And we had various different uh, sort of plans uh, of how we were going to do it. And then we just ended up with two massive crisscrossing uh, corridors that we then could move around, basically. And we had to keep on moving them around just to try and ring the changes and try and hopefully make it feel like it. We, were different. we had different lights with different floors and uh, different combinations. But the, the 
thing about storage units is they do look the same. You know, now if you make it look too different, then you lose that element of where am I? Have I just been here before? But we did keep on moving stuff around. Sometimes people got trapped behind the stuff that we moved around, so they had to sort of climb over various things. One of the actors came to the set one day and couldn't find a way back into it because we moved it around so much. But we, we shot it basically in the studio. Inside. I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the casting for it. Um, it's, it's quite an interesting cast that you've got there for the film. Yeah, I mean, anything in particular about the cast? Um, it's just really, Misha Barton, I've not really seen her in, in much um, recently. Mm. Um, and to see her in a, uh, quite a gory horror film like that was, was quite surprising. Um, and uh, was it Emily Atak? Emily Atak. Atak, yeah. yeah. Um, so it, it was quite, a, quite <laughs> interesting to see both yeah. of them at the start of the film together. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, Misha is very well known. She's sort of one of these people that, you know, a lot of actors, great actors, you know, people who make the films know them, but, you know, most people don't know who the hell they are. You know, there's only sort of 20 British actors that people really know, and the rest kind of die off. So, you know, it's useful to have somebody that people know, you know, people in South America know who Misha Barton is, and, and that's a useful thing. And. You know, she's been away for a little bit, but now she's back. She's been very prolific in the last year. I think she's made about 10 or 15 films recently. And, um, you know, cast her. She was interested in doing the film. I was a little nervous about working with her. Um, she was challenging to work with, but I, um, <laughs> which is a good experience, working with challenging people. Um, you know, you learn a lot of life skills doing these things. And, um, but I was very happy with what she did. I think she's a really good actress. You know, she's been a lot, you know, she started off on Broadway when she was 10, she was a child actress. She'd done a lot of theatre. Um, she was in Sixth Sense, she was in Notting Hill, I think. Um, and um, she, you know, she's, I think she does a lot with her eyes, you know, which is what you're always looking for in an actor. With an actor. Uh, Robert Nepper, I'd love from uh, Prison Break. Um, don't know if you guys, I'm sure some people know Prison Break. And uh, I think it's the most interesting sort of character in that show. Um, again, he's a theatre actor, you know, he started off in you know, Chicago and New York. Um, like a lot of these people, when you talk to them, you find out they've been, you know, working in theatre for 20 years until they finally get a break. Um, I think John Hamm from Mad Men sort of did that. He actually went back to teach as an actor in his hometown before finally he got Mad Men. Um, Emily's great, she does a great American accent, and we get attack from the Indians. Her mother was actually um, one of the voices for uh, Spitting Image, and uh, I think she used to do Margaret Thatcher, so Emily grew up with her mum doing all these impersonations around the kitchen table, so she's brilliant with accents, and um, she did a great American accent. Um, and you know, you just get a few people and then you bring them all together. I mean, I, I really think Andrew Buckley is brilliant, uh, playing the, the guy who runs the security um, place, and in a way that was the hardest part to cast, because you get actors in, go, look, this is the guy that's going to turn out to be the bad guy. And they walk through the door and you look at them and you go, killer. Killer. <laughs> killer. <laughs> you know, if we were to look at everyone here, including us two, most, <laughs> no, 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 especially us, 97% of the time you kind of go, well, uh, probable killer. You know? <laughs> so you're really looking for somebody going, oh no, he's, he's, he's not the killer. You know, because it, you know, horror audiences are so sophisticated. They've seen every single twist and turn. They second guess every single thing. Um, my sister's a bit like that. I don't know how she does it. She'll watch five minutes of a film and she'll go, he did it. And I'm like, but he didn't even say anything. You know? and she just knows these things. So that was actually the hardest. I've got some great actors in. I thought, they're really good, but they just look like a killer. <laughs> and Andrew Buckley looked like a bank manager to me. Gregory, you choose. Hiya. Yeah. Hi. What would you say was the kind of most uh, challenging overall of uh, bringing this to, um, well, creating this uh, picture? I would say without shadow of doubt, working with Misha Barton. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> that was a short answer. <laughs> you sign. You choose. You do front or oh, back or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't fall out. Don't do it, don't do it. So, if it was um, filmed in London, yes. 
quite a few um, British actors. Yes. Sam from Casualty. <laughs> um, why did you set in New York? Yes. Um, it's a good question. I mean, I'm writing a film at the moment, a supernatural crime story uh, called Reckoning, which is set in London, and it's about the British crime family, and it's a very London-based story. And when I was working on this, we didn't really have a location, a you know, setting, just a city. And it just didn't feel to me like it had to be a London story. It could have been anywhere, you know. And um, all the other stuff I've made has always been set in the UK. I love quite, you know, doing stuff that's quite real, that's sort of local. But with this, I just felt it didn't have to be here. Wouldn't it be interesting to go and shoot some stuff in New York, you know? Um, so I guess that was the reason. It didn't, didn't feel... And also, since we come up with this idea that Ella's boyfriend is this banker, this very rich banker, and he's like a Wall Street banker, and it kind of fitted together. Um, so um, I think this film could have been set anyway. Great. Since it was uh, shot in both uh, London and New York, was it easier to shoot in one country over the other, or was it difficult? Um, I mean, in, in America, they really help you out shooting, you know, um, and, um, you know, they have a whole department to, to this whole police department that helps you to shoot, which is so, you know, in London, they sort of, we, we were lucky because we didn't have to shoot any exteriors in London, but I tried to do that before, and it's very difficult. You can't shoot here, this borough, you know, there's a famous thing where if you want to shoot somebody jumping off Waterloo Bridge, there's 12 different organisations you've got to contact. If, if they fall one side, it's this borough. They, if they swim to the North Bank, you've got to deal with this. Swim to the South Bank, you've got to deal with Lambert. You've got the River Police, you've got the Bridge Police, you've got the Transport Police. It's so complicated. Whereas in America, they make it very, very, you know, they like to publicise the city, you know. Um, that said, we shot three mils and... Um, yeah, it's not the most, um, uh, you know, deluxe studio in the UK, um, but it has everything you need, and you know, it worked it really worked for us at the price. But um, I think I think when you're on the streets, shooting in America is a lot lot easier than it is in England. Hello. Hi. Um, for a film with that kind of tone, it, it felt quite fresh to see quite a lot. Quite, um, there's a lot of funny moments in there. When you were shooting the film, was that always your intention? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I like comedy, and uh, you know, I like, you know, I, I like kind of enthusiasm. I like a lot of dark comedy, you know, and I wanted to try and make. You know, I think people are funny in real life. When you talk to people, they make jokes all the time. They make sharp, acerbic comments. People take a piss out of each other, and. I, I, you know, I guess I did try to put some funny bits in. I mean, I like, there's a bit where um, after uh, Stephen kills a creature by stabbing him in the throat uh, with a pen and all the blood comes out. And Paul Hyatt, who's here, did this amazing bloodline of all this. It's quite disgusting, you know, the whole thing. Quite disgusting to shoot it as well. And, um, but we really got Stephen just to sort of brush it off as a bit another annoying, you know, the idea for him was, it's just he's having a really bad day, you know? <laughs> and it's just like another shitty thing to fuck up his bed, to, to mess up his bed. Okay, <laughs> bastard. And, and he, just, he did that thing very nicely, you know. He brushes himself off, and the glass comes off, and you know, we, we just thought it was fun, you know, to try and bring that humorous element in there. And, you know, I mean, hopefully people do find it a bit funny. I think it also helps relieve the tension a bit. You know, I mean, I guess there's always a danger if it's trying to be funny. And it undermine, and it just isn't. There's no tension at all. Then, then, because I think when you do, you know, hot comedy thrillers and comedy horrors, well, certain comedy thrillers, I don't think work because you can't engage with the thriller aspect if it's too funny. You know, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of great comedy horrors. That's a whole sort of genre in itself. But hopefully, if it didn't undermine the the tension, then then, then it's definitely what we were aiming for. You touched briefly on that a bit earlier. Uh, tell us about the next project in slightly more detail. Okay, well, uh, I'm working on a, a film called The Reckoning at the moment, which is a set in a uh, British set story, um, and uh, it's a sort of supernatural crime story. It's about uh, the enforcer for a, a, a crime gang, quite an old school gang, um, and he's having a midlife crisis. He kind of wants to get out, but he can't really train, he doesn't know anything else. Um, and uh, he starts uh, getting terrorised by certain people. He doesn't know who these people are. 
and they chase him to the street, he gets hit by a car, and lots of you know, nasty things are happening to him. He's trying to find out who these people are, and he, he recognises he's one of them, he puts two of them together. He realises they're people that he's already killed, basically. He's killed a lot of people, and these are some of the people that he's killed. And as the story goes on, more and more of the people that he's killed uh, start appearing. And it's sort of a story about, you know, guilty guy with guilty conscience, and it sort of poses the question, you know, if you've done a lot of bad things, what price do you have to pay? You know, it's sort of like, you know, we can all do anything in life. We can, you know, we can be good or we can be bad, but there's a price to pay for everything that we do. And this guy starts to have to pay the price. And at the same time, he is, um, somebody's ripped off this, this gang. Uh, his best friend is ripped off this gang. He's trying to track down his best friend, but he's being impeded in that journey by these people that are coming back to wreak their revenge. And you don't really know, you're thinking, is he having a breakdown? Are they real? You know, are these real supernatural beings that have turned up in his world? Is he just hallucinating? Um, so, you know, one film that we, me and my writing partner really likes, Jacob's Ladder, where you never really know, is it in his head or is it really in the world? And um, it's quite interesting sort of mixing the crime genre with the supernatural. And uh, it's, it should be, hopefully it should be quite interesting for I was sitting in the introduction, um, The Horde, I think you were the first people in the world to see The very this. first. Yeah. So please tweet about it if you liked it, and we'll retweet, etc. Et Thank you so much, Matt Wynn, for coming. Good luck with the film, and good luck with the next one. Thank you very much. Thank you.